Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity, an unconventional, no apologies exposition of God's grace. I'm Pastor Brett Walker. This week we begin a new sermon series based on questions asked by the congregations at Ebenezer and Hudson. I asked them back in January to ask the tough questions of faith, and they responded with 14 really good and challenging questions, which we will be taking on all summer long. This week we look at miracles, and whether God continues to perform miracles even today. It's an uplifting message with promise. So grab your Bible, turn it to Luke chapter 17, and prepare your heart and mind as we look at modern day miracles. And now uh, please take out your Bibles, either the ones that you brought with you or the ones in the pews. And turn in them with me to the book of Luke, chapter 17. If you're following in the Pew Bibles, it's found on page 82 of the New Testament. We're beginning a new series that will carry us through the summer. Uh, probably all the way through the summer to the end of September. Uh, and the series is called Deep Questions. I asked you back in January to give me the questions that perplex you or confuse you or even just questions that you might have about faith, about the Bible, about a relationship with God. And you gave me some very, very good questions, very difficult questions to answer. And I am not one who shies away from a challenge. I knew what I was getting myself into when I asked for those questions. Uh, Back when I was a a youth leader at Pittman, uh, one of the first things I did was I started um, what I called Q&A at the end of every uh, youth Bible study that we had, and where I I offered the kids some time at the end of every Bible study to ask whatever they want to know, anything at all. And if I knew the answer, I would give it to them plainly, and I wouldn't candy coat it, and I wouldn't give them, you know, a, a... um, well, a BS answer, let's say. Um, but I, if I didn't know the answer, uh, I wouldn't give them a wrong answer. I would go and research it and bring the answer back the next week. And they really liked that. You know, uh, being in sixth grade and being able to ask whatever you want of an adult and receive an answer is very empowering. So I thought, let's do the same thing here. And you gave me, like I said, 14 questions. I have 14 questions. I'm going to address them each one per week. Uh, The question before us this week is as follows. There are many stories in the Bible where God produced miracles before thousands of people to prove He was the one and only God. When in modern times do you think this has happened? So the question before us really is, Does God still perform miracles? And if so, what miracles has he performed uh, in modern times? Uh, And if he doesn't perform miracles, then why did he stop? That's really kind of the underlying question, too. So let's look at this question today. The title of the message is Modern Day Miracles, and uh, our text is from Luke 17. We're going to begin at verse 11. Let us hear the word of the Lord for us today. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go shew yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that returned to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. May God pour out his rich blessing upon this, the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. 
Lord God, you have shown us signs and wonders. Open our eyes now to see the wonder of your works that we may believe. And in believing, give you the glory you are due. For we ask it in the name of Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. What is the definition of a miracle? What constitutes a miracle? There are many ways that we can look at things and say that they are a miracle. Uh, in, in modern times, we have certain things that we uh, attribute to miracles, or even um, we use the word miracle in, um, in common language usage. Uh, one of my favorite Christmas time movies, A Miracle on 34th Street, which happens to be about Santa Claus, but we'll go past that. Um, but it seems as if a miracle to me, a miracle is uh, best described uh, in a movie, which we have movie nights here at the church. I can guarantee you this movie will never be played at the church. The movie's called Pulp Fiction. It came out in 1994. Uh, it was uh, directed by Quentin Tarantino. But there was a scene in that, partic- understand that the people in that movie are really bad people. There's really not a good person in that movie at all, and that's fine. But, um, so in one scene, a couple of men went to kill some people, right? Uh, and they didn't realize that there was a boy hiding out in the bathroom with a gun. So after they killed uh, the people that they went to kill, this boy breaks out of the uh, bathroom and says, Die! And starts shooting his gun, right? Bang, 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 bang. Empties it. And the two guys are standing there and they look down at themselves and they look at each other and realize they hadn't been shot and then they shot and killed the boy, right? Well, then the one turns around and looks at the bullet holes in the wall behind them and he says, this was a miracle. We should have been dead. We should have been dead. And the other man, John Travolta, by the way, said, these things happen. These things happen. Our response to miracles is one of those two. It's either to acknowledge that it is a miracle by God, or it is just something that happens. That it's improbable, but not impossible. The Collins English Dictionary says that a miracle is an event that is contrary to the established laws of nature and attributed to a supernatural cause. Something that could not possibly happen, but it happened anyway. And so, it must have been God that did it. That's the definition of a miracle. But we've taken that definition and we've said, well, a miracle is not necessarily something that's impossible. A lot of times a miracle is just something that is improbable. It's not impossible, it's just improbable. Uh, One of my favorite examples of a miracle, uh, being a sports fan, happened on November 19th, 1979. Do you remember that? November 19th, 1979, the Philadelphia Eagles were visiting the New York Giants. And the Eagles were down in the fourth quarter with just seconds remaining. Just seconds. No timeouts. Uh, they were down 17 to 12. And, all, and, New, and uh, the Giants had the ball. All Joe Pisarczyk had to do was hike the ball and take a knee, and the game was over. That's all he had to do. But for some unknown reason, he decided he was going to hand the ball off to his running back, who fumbled the ball, and Herm Edwards came across the line, picked up the ball, ran it in for a touchdown. The Eagles win 1917. They called it the Miracle in the Meadowlands. They called it the Miracle in the Meadowlands. Uh, But it wasn't impossible. It was just highly improbable. Uh, Who would have thought that Joe Pisarczyk would try to hand the ball off instead of taking a knee? Because of, that, uh, because of that particular play, uh, 
the winning team or the team that's leading at the end of the fourth quarter, if they have possession of the ball, now lines up in what's called the victory formation. And you'll see they're all surrounding the quarterback because they don't want anybody to come in if he fumbles the ball. And there's one guy who stands way in the back behind the quarterback in case somebody does fumble the ball so he can tackle the guy, right? That's the victory formation. And it came about as part of the miracle in the Meadowlands. But was that really a miracle? I mean, did God really cause the fumble? Uh, did God cause Joe Pisarchik to have sort of a brain fart and say, oh, I'm going to hand the ball off, you know? Um, did God put the ball into the hands of, uh, of Herm Edwards? No, uh, I don't think he did. That was an improbable thing, but it wasn't impossible. A miracle to me is when God does the impossible. Uh, but what is our response to that? Let me look at this text today. So um, we've read three readings, and they all had to do with healings. The first one uh, was the healing of Naaman. Naaman was a Syrian general. He was a, a pagan, and he was a leper. Now, being a leper, he, he was probably shunned by his people, even though he was a general. He was a great general who won a lot of battles. And so he had some esteem, but he had this disease. And the disease made him an outcast, even among his peers. And so the king of Syria sends to Israel and says, um, heal my general of his leprosy. He goes and... Elisha tells him something very strange. He says, just dip yourself in the waters of the Jordan seven times. He gets belligerent about it. He says, I could dip myself in the waters back home. Why did I have to come to Israel? And have you ever seen the Jordan River? The Jordan River is this muddy, dirty river. It's ugly. And the, the rivers in Damascus are much, much cleaner. But his, his, his uh, servants said to him, listen, if the, if the prophet had said something that you had to do that was difficult, would you do that? All he's asking you to do is to dip yourself in the river. So he did, and he was made clean. The, the text tells us his skin was restored like that of a young boy. Now, we didn't read this part, but his response to that miracle was to go back to Elisha and acknowledge, first of all, that the God of Israel is God, that he was no longer going to worship the, the false gods of Samaria. And he went so far as to say, I will take two donkey loads of soil back with me so that I can have some of Israel with me because I know that there is a God who lives here. And he also said, listen, sometimes I have to go with the king. Part of his duties were to go with the king into the pagan temple. And the king was infirm, and he would have to lean on Naaman's shoulder. And when the king would kneel at the altar of the false gods, Naaman would have to kneel too. And he said, listen, when I do that, I'm not kneeling to those false gods, because I will only ever kneel to Yahweh, the God of Israel. Elisha said, it's okay. It's okay. That was his response. His response was to give glory to God. Think about the second healing that we read about today. In the beautiful gate at, uh, in the temple, Peter uh, healed a person who was born crippled. He was born crippled. And he healed him just by commanding him in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And what was his response? He stood up, he leaped, it says, he leaped. And he went into the temple leaping and praising God. That was his response. His response to the miracle was to give glory to God. What about the story here in Luke? Luke was a physician. And Luke was a man of science. And so he wrote a lot about Jesus' healings because they intrigued him as a man of science. Now, granted, their medical understanding at that time was not like our medical understanding today, but 
he recognized that there was something unusual that was going on here. That there was something about these healings that was miraculous. The disease of leprosy in the Bible is, could be any skin ailment, but the disease that we mostly uh, connect it with today is called Hansen's disease. Hansen's disease is a debilitating disease. It's a, it's a disease that causes uh, nerve damage and bodily degradation, and uh, it actually causes your body to decay while you're living in it. It's a horrible disease. It's, it's, it's really, and for the most part, the people who have Hansen's disease throughout history have been shunned by the rest of society. In, in Israel, uh, it was their law that if someone were a leper, that it was probably due to a sin that they had committed, and so they were being punished for their sin. And so they had to cover themselves up from head to toe, and they would walk through the street, and everywhere they went, they would declare, unclean, unclean, so that nobody would come near them and accidentally brush up against them and become unclean themselves. Nobody wanted to touch a leper. Nobody wanted to go near them for fear of being made unclean. And so these ten lepers uh, in this village, they stood afar off. They didn't want to make Jesus unclean. Note that in other healing narratives where uh, Jesus encounters a leper, there's one where he goes down and touches the man. He makes himself unclean for the man to make him clean, to heal him. And that's what he did for us on the cross. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be healed. But in this case, they stood afar off and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And so Jesus said, go show yourselves unto the priests. Now, in the book of Leviticus, there's a very specific set of rules that they have to do if they, are, uh, if they have leprosy or if, if, uh, in order to treat leprosy. And one of the things is they would show themselves to the priest. The priest would examine the leprosy and then he would quarantine them for seven days and then he would examine it again. And if it was spreading, he would know that it was leprosy. And so he would declare them to be unclean. Then they would have to cover themselves up and go about and say, unclean, unclean. So they were, being, they were going to show themselves to the priests. But as they were going, they were cleansed. Their leprosy was cured. And he didn't touch them. And nobody would have seen it. Nobody would have known that it happened except that one of them looked at himself and said, oh my gosh, I'm clean, I'm cured, I'm, I'm, I'm saved. And he ran back to Jesus and he fell at his feet and he gave glory to God and he thanked Jesus. The text goes out of the way to say that he was a Samaritan. The Samaritans were uh, sort of a mixture of Jew and pagan because they believed in many gods and one of the gods that they worshipped was Yahweh, the God of Israel. It was, a, it was a, a mixture of religions and so they were despised by the Jews. The text goes out of the way to say that only the Samaritan returned. Jesus said, we're not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? How come the other nine didn't come back to give glory to God? Because they probably thought it's improbable, but not impossible. It's just one of those things that happens. You know? He says to him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. It was your faith. It's because you believed, it's because you knew in your heart that I could heal you that I did heal you. Why do we today feel a need to explain miracles using modern scientific terms? I don't understand this, this, uh, this need to do that. 
There's a lot of shows on TV, especially the Discovery Channel and the History Channel, where they look at biblical miracles and try to explain them using modern science. For example, there was a show about uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they said, well, it might have been a volcanic eruption that happened. It wasn't really fire and brimstone that rained from the sky. And they talked about, um, well, there's a, there's a volcano that's so many miles to the south and that could have erupted at that time. And the, the wind was just right. It would have rained down fire on them, you know. Or the, the parting of the Red Sea. Um, they said, well, they found a, 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 a land bridge under the waters, and so it might have been a tidal thing. There could have been an earthquake, an offshore earthquake, where the waters receded, and the Hebrews went across, and then the waters came back like a tidal wave and washed away the Egyptian army. That doesn't explain why in the Bible it says that the waters stood like a wall on either side of the Hebrews as they walked through. That's miraculous. The other is just a freak of nature. What about the virgin birth? I saw a a show that said that, um, well, it could have happened because, um, you know, there are certain amphibians, uh, especially tree frogs that have been known to spontaneously fertilize themselves in the absence of males. You know, uh, I'm pretty sure there was no absence of males or lack of males in in, in Nazareth at the time. Uh, But again, trying so hard to make these things fit into our modern understanding. Um, The Star of Bethlehem, the feeding of the multitudes, All these miracles have been uh, attempted to be explained using modern science. I think about, I call it the Wizard of Oz effect. The Wizard of Oz effect. Uh, You know the Wizard of Oz? It's a better movie than Pulp Fiction, right? Um, Well, (laughs) the Wizard of Oz, uh, after Dorothy's house is lifted up in I, uh, in a tornado, the entire house picked up and carried to another place which is not on earth and a magical place and, he, and dropped right on a, a witch, right? Um, I'm not spoiling this movie for anybody, am I? <laughs> I, I want to make sure that I'm not, you know, spoiler alert, you know, the witch dies. So, but uh, they're singing a song and Glinda says... Um, a miracle occurred, and Dorothy says, it really was no miracle. What happened was just this. Right? Really? I mean, the whole house was picked up by a, a tornado and dropped in this magical land, but it wasn't a miracle. It was just the thing that happens. Right? Uh, I think about... When I think about modern miracles, I mean, I can... We could quote a lot of stories of things that happen, and and sometimes people will say, well, these things happen, you know? Um, I think about uh, St. Anne de Beaupre. It is a a beautiful old church in Quebec City. I've been there, and the first thing that you notice when you walk into St. Anne de Beaupre, uh, the sanctuary there, are these two supporting columns uh, at the rear of the sanctuary as you first walk in, and... They are completely covered from floor to ceiling, like 50 feet high, with crutches and walkers and surrounded by wheelchairs. People who came in on these crutches and the walkers and left without them because they didn't need them because they had been healed. It's it's amazing to see how many people have been healed in this, in this place. And it's hard to chalk it up to just coincidence when you see the sheer number of uh, crutches and canes and, and walkers and things like that. Uh, you can read books like, I have a book called Real Life, Real Miracles. Real Life, Real Miracles by James Garlow and Keith Wall. 
Uh, I was reading a story in there, and it, it, it touched me because I was a diesel mechanic uh, in, another, in another phase of my life. And um, so when I read this story, it really struck me because the first thing it said was the guy was, he was wrapping it up. He was wrapping up a job. And the only thing that was left was to put the, the left front tire back on the, on the tractor, right? Um, tractor trailer, tractor. Um, and the only thing that was holding it up was a hydraulic jack. Now, if you know anything about working on a truck, if you jack up a truck, you've got to put jack stands under the axle because jack stands are made to hold a heavy load for a long period of time. A jack is just meant to lift it up for a short period of time. And you certainly wouldn't feel safe if it was just a hydraulic jack that was holding it up. So, but just as he was wrapping it up, the, the owner of the truck said, listen, there was also a, uh, a leak on the oil pan that I noticed. Could you check that out too? And so the, the, truck, the truck was actually running at this time. And he said, all right, he gets on the creeper and he slides underneath. And he says, hop up into the cab and tell me what the temperature gauge says. So when he got into the cab, the weight of the truck shifted and the jack fell and the axle fell right on the man's pelvis, shattered his pelvis. The axle went, he said he looked down and it was about an inch off the ground. That's how far it had gone through his body. Severed five major arteries severed his, it it damaged his pancreas and his spleen. And his first words when it happened, he said he spit out blood. And then he said, God help me, was the first thing he said. God help me. See, this man had gone through a drug addiction and had been uh, saved two years before. He gave his life to Christ. And he was no longer in the grip of addiction. And he knew that if God could have saved him from his addiction, that he could save him from this too. And so that was his response. God help me. He yelled to the man to call 911. He got out of the cab and he jacked up the trailer again, and went, or the truck again. And when he jacked it up, the man, he tried to pull himself out. And he said his upper body went, but his legs stayed. And at that point, he actually died. He said he felt himself pulled out of his body, and he was like floating above and looking down on this scene and seeing his, his friend like frantically calling 911. And he said there were two other men who were standing there on either side of his body. And it was like they were holding his body together. He said he'd never seen them before, but they seemed to be glowing with light. And he saw the first responders come, the first ambulance that came. They looked at the scene and they said, nothing we could do for this guy. They were going to call the morgue. The second ambulance came and there was a woman who was part of the ambulance uh, team that immediately went to work and started barking orders. And she got down on right and she, she held the man's face and was looking at his face and saying, Bill, I need you to work with me. I need you to want to be here. And he said he felt himself go back into his body. He opened his eyes and he looked in her eyes and he stayed conscious. He said the pain was immense. But she kept him conscious. conscious. It was 80 minutes it took them to get him to the trauma center. And the doctors, when he got there, They said, how in the world did this guy survive? With five severed arteries, he should have bled out in 10 minutes. With a damaged spleen and damaged pancreas, his liver was damaged as well. There's no way this man should have survived. But he did. They gave him surgery after surgery, and they, they found that his vertebrae was crushed, but his spinal cord was not severed. In fact, the vertebrae was actually all that was holding that truck up off the ground. And... His small intestine, some of his small intestine had to be removed. And then some more. 
because it was damaged and it was decaying and it, it kept pulling out more and more until he had none left. And then he started to lose weight because he, he could, his body couldn't digest. He, his body couldn't uh, hold on to the nutrients that he needed. He started to die. He said a man also named Bill came to him. Didn't know him, but the man said God put it on his heart to come and pray for this man. And he said, he said he prayed like he, he never heard anybody pray before. He prayed, he said, he said, I'm praying to the mountain. Talking about when Jesus said, if you pray, if you command that, if you have faith like a mustard seed and you command that mountain to jump into the water, it will. So he said, I'm praying to the mountain. God, don't just heal this man, repair him, fix him. And he said it felt like there was a snake unraveling in his abdomen. And he didn't think anything of it, except that he started to gain weight again. And the doctors thought he was retaining fluids. And they became alarmed. They sent him off to x-ray. And the x-ray technician said, this doesn't make any sense. Because according to his chart, he had all of his small intestine removed. But this man has... 10 feet of small intestine in his body. Grew the small intestine inside him. How do you explain that? You can't. You can't. But he gave glory to God. He knew in that moment that God could heal him, and he did. He rescued him. I want to end with this story. I could tell you story after story, but I want to tell you this last story. It's about a 14-year-old girl. Her mother had been through a lot of marriages uh, and now had just gotten married to another man. She, she really, as this 14-year-old girl, couldn't identify him as like a father figure in her life. She really didn't have a father figure. She didn't even know her own father. But her mother married this guy and he was a union guy, so um, he had good medical insurance and put her and her daughter on the insurance. A month after the marriage, after the wedding, and when she was on the insurance, she was in a horrible accident. A bike, she was riding a bike, and a, a young man drove through a stop sign and hit her bike, she was flung off, she hit her head, she lost teeth, she broke her leg. It was a terrible accident. Um, her stepfather actually came to the scene and collected the teeth that had come out, out of her mouth and took them to the hospital where they put them back in. They were able to save her teeth. Um, but here she goes. She, this happened in August, and they were going, uh, she was starting school, so she had to start school on crutches with a broken arm, and, and, and her teeth were cemented in, and it made her feel very self-conscious at 14 years old. I mean, who, who wouldn't? She, always, she already felt awkward, and she already felt kind of like a loner, but this made her feel even more so. And she, because of the insurance that her stepfather had, um, the insurance company went after the young man who was driving the car and obtained a large settlement, $35,000, which she was not allowed to get until she was 18 years old. Because, I mean, what 14-year-old kid is really responsible enough to handle 35? Well, what 18-year-old kid is really responsible enough, you know? But at the age of 18... She had dropped out of school. She was still feeling very alienated. And now she gets this big settlement, you know. And with that settlement money, she went and she bought a TV and she bought a VCR and she bought a, a video camera and, a, and another, like a, a picture camera. And she bought a computer. And then she did things like she would take her friends out to lunch all the time you know, um, really blew through this whole settlement very quickly. 
But that computer, she found that she could log on online and she could talk to people around the country who didn't know what she looked like, who didn't know her, didn't know her background. And it was like a clean slate to her. And while she was online, she met a guy who was older, who was uh, in the middle of a divorce, who had two children, but there was something about him. It clicked with her. And it clicked with him, this relationship. He lived all the way on the other side of the country. They never would have met otherwise. And eventually, she took the last bit of her settlement money and she spent it on a plane ticket for this man to fly out and meet her face to face, which he did. And while he was there, he felt this connection and he asked her to marry him. Now, it seems really sudden, you know, these things never happen like that. Why would it happen? But she gave up her whole life and she moved all the way across the country at 19 years old to be with this guy who was 27 and she's, now she's taking care of his kids, you know? If you hadn't figured it out, by the way, I'm talking about Aaron, my wife. That's how we met. She was 14 years old when she had that accident. And if she had had that accident a month before she wouldn't have been covered by the insurance. If she had not had that accident, she wouldn't have had the settlement money. And if she didn't have the settlement money, she wouldn't have gotten the computer. And if she wouldn't have had the computer, she probably never would have met me. 3,000 miles away. Now, does that mean that God approved of my divorce? No. But God can use those things that happen against his will, for something better. And Aaron and I tried for 16 years to have children and couldn't, and then all of a sudden, we were blessed with Isaac. You know Isaac, right? He is a miracle. And I don't know what God has in store for him, but I know it's something fantastic That kid's a miracle. Everything about his existence is a miracle. Now you could say, well, it's just a bunch of coincidences. But you know what I think? That sometimes a coincidence is just God's perfect timing. So the question is not, does God still perform miracles? Rather, it should be, why do we refuse to see the miracles when they occur. The world wants to have a comfortable explanation for the unexplainable. The world uses science and technology to explain away miracles. Or at best, they may take a story like Aaron's and mine and say, it's just a coincidence. God did not decide one day to stop performing miracles. I think that as we have grown as a civilization, we have simply stopped seeing miracles as an act of God. But I challenge you this week, take a look around. Look back on your life, how it's been ordered and the things that have happened to you in just the right way. And I bet that you will begin to see that God really does perform miracles even today. Let us pray. O most gracious heavenly God, our Father, we are in awe of you. You continue to amaze us, Lord, even though we ought not be amazed. After all, you are the God who spoke the universe into being, and you created everything from nothing, and all nature bends to your whim. Why then should we be so amazed when you perform miracles in our midst? 
Open our eyes to see the wonders you perform. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness and mercy. And we thank you especially for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for today's podcast. If you live in the Salem County area, you can join us in person. Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Auburn holds its worship service every Sunday at 9 a.m. And Hudson United Methodist Church in Pedertown holds its worship service at 1030. We also have Bible study during the week. If our message today has touched you in some way, won't you let us know in the comments? We hope you'll join us again for Guerrilla Christianity. God bless you.